Hello, okay. my name is Dominique Ryle. I'm a professor of modern European history at the University of Miami and currently uh, the Fulbright Imera Chair of Migration Studies in Marseille, France. And I have the amazing opportunity to interview um, this uh, scholar, Marcus Vetze, who just uh, won honorable mention from the Society for Italian Historical Studies, SIHS, as we like to call it, um, for his uh, article that came out in 2022 with the journal Modern Italy titled The Social Lives of Mass-Produced Images of 1935 to 1941. Before I, I talk with Marcus about his work, I just wanted to give some background of who he is and then also read the citation explaining why his article was chosen. Marcus studied history and German language and literature at the universities of Graz and Bologna. He was a research assistant and lecturer at, in Graz and in Linz. Then he was a research fellow in Rome, Vienna, Florence, Harvard, Bolzano, as well as a three-year postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology in Halle. Since September 2023, and right now it's uh, March 2024, so very recently he joined uh, the University of Graz and the Institute of History as a lecturer. He's been very busy. He has already published his first book in German, Der lange Atem, Koloniale Bilder, Visuelle Praktiken von Ex-Soldaten und ihre Familien in Südtirol, Alte Adige, 1935-2015, which in English is the long breath of colonial pictures, visual practices of, of, of ex-soldiers and their families in Südtirol, 1935-2015, published by Wallstein in 2023, which also won the Jubilee Prize from Berlin. He's co-coordinator of a website that I hope we get to talk about sometime in this interview, postcolonialitaly.com. Postcolonial and he's currently working on a second book, which I hope he'll also talk about later on. Now, last boring thing before we actually get to talk, I want to read the citation that the committee that was made up of uh, Professor Silvana Patriarca from For Fordham University, she was serving as chair, Dario Gaggio uh, from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and Mia Fuller from uh, UC Berkeley wrote uh, to explain why they chose Marcus's article. They said they were happy to award uh, honorable mention to Marcus Wetzer for his article, quote, the social lives of mass produced images of 1935-41 Italian Italo-Ethiopian War published in Modern Italy 2022. In this beautifully written essay, Vetsa provides an original reading of ordinary soldiers' uses of mass-produced images of Ethiopia in the context of the Italian fascist war and occupation. Conceptually rich and methodolo methodologically astute, Vetsa's article advances significantly our understanding of the private uses of the public images that the regime produced to build consensus among its population. Focusing on the postcard collections of a number of so-called allogeny, in this case, the German-speaking inhabitants of the province of Bolz and Bolzano, the article enriches the important historiography that makes use of visual sources and helps us to understand the soldiers' attitudes towards the fascist colonial war in an Italian region of recent annexation. Marcus, I'm sure you were pretty touched by this. It's clear they really, really you know, absorbed your article and thought about it, especially this group, which knows the history of fascism so well. What were you more surprised by it in 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 the, their choosing of it and their description of the article? Do you think that it was a proper summary of what the article was trying to do, or was there something there that you thought was surprising in their emphasis? Um, I think they really grasp the the idea of my article, and they they really. Um, brought it to a point what I was trying to do in my article that I I tried to find a new angle and new perspective on this mass produced images because usually um, scholars had little interest in this mass produced images because they thought that um, the material that is really of interest is the the, the photographs that are taken um, produced by 
so-called ordinary soldiers and that the other material the, the the postcards the 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 propaganda material isn't that interesting because it does not offer an authentic insight in 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 a, a reality of war and so i tried to to offer a new reading of this material um by by looking at the ways how ordinary men um adopted, appropriated, used this visual material. I, I I really enjoyed the article, as you can imagine, because I always try to think of Italy being a much more complicated space than just a quote unquote nation state. And I was struck by your choice to choose Alogeni as the primary authors of using mass produced images. And I was wondering why did you choose Alogeny and why did you choose these particular four in, as the case study? So um, I did my master thesis already on an ordinary man from the province of Bozen Bolzano um, who participated in the in the colonial war against Ethiopia. So that was then kind of natural way for me to go in my PhD project. And uh, the article is is dealing with an aspect of this um, research project. So um, that was kind of my entrance into this topic. But when I got into the study of of colonialism and and dealt with the question of how colonialism is is contributing to the nation uh, empire building, I I realized that the South Tyrolean case study allows me to um, offer a rich and new perspective on on this nationalization and, and uh, empire building processes mm -hmm. because um, as it is written in the in the um, uh, in the certificate um, it is kind of a perspective from the outside and it, it's it's not only about how I mean it is about how did this man who fought in Ethiopia for the fascist state perceived themselves and how they um, how they um, interpret their role in their in their home province at the very same time. Mm -hmm. So their um, the, the question of belonging is a very central in in that one, of course. Mm -hmm. I I also was wondering how you found the families that kept mm. the, the things did you put out an ad in the newspaper did you go to the the community center how did you access who kept what mm -hmm. it was a difficult task actually because <laughs> as you can imagine uh, this private material is is um is not available in public archives these private collections are still with the families who kept who are keeping them for decades by now and um, so what I did is actually I, I launched a call uh, via regional newspapers asking for help asking for families to share the materials with me and um, it, it was a complete surprise to me but around 60 to 70 families got in touch with me offering the help and the materials they have in their attics in the living rooms in their cellars and so um it was really did hard you, for me to yeah. sorry sorry i didn't mean to interrupt but did you make the um ads only in german or did you also make them in italian uh i made the ads only in in german because i was interested in the in the in the processes of memory production and the visual practices of this German speaking um, group within the Italian um, state. Yeah, and this is why I really uh, narrowed it down to the German speaking society in the province of Bolzano, Bozen. Mm. I, I like that choice because you, you seem to have chosen families that didn't get quote unquote Italianized to the point where their, lang their language of home changed to Italian, which did happen. Um, so you chose people part of an imperial fascist project who, after its after its demise, had not been Italianized to the point where they weren't using German still as their primary language. I think that's a very interesting um, methodology. 
So uh, the, the, the committee quite rightly emphasized the methodological inno innovativeness of treating objects as social products and trying to think of them, I think you use the term techno-anthropologically, uh, which yeah, my brain went, woo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I was wondering about the people and if we could treat them socially, if you could give us a little bit more insight about class. Because I was wondering how much these objects mattered also because these were poor families or these objects mattered because these were, you know, middle class or is there yeah. any idea that you have of why the objects were meaningful also about a consumption? Uh, well, um, I think class definitely matters when we are talking about the, the visual practices of colonialists, mm -hmm. colonial soldiers. Uh, what I saw in my research is that photography, of course, transformed into a popular everyday practice in the 1930s uh, at the latest. Um, that means that photo equipment became cheaper, easier to handle in terms of the technical uh, dimensions. And that means that a lot of men tried to participate in this visual scramble for Africa. Um, sons of farmers and, and workers, craftsmen, the same as, as um, um, men who are understand, who consider themselves as members of the bourgeoisie mm -hmm. um, and so on. But the difference I see is that um, the latter could afford photo equipment like photo upper, photo photo cameras and who had also this um, cultural capital to 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 produce a photo album afterwards for instance mm -hmm. and those men who who came from families from farmer families who worked as craftsmen or or workers in in companies um, they participated in this in this visual hunt for the right image um, as well, but in different ways. So they were they relied on buying images, exchanging them, copying them, um, maybe borrowing a photo camera from from a colleague in order to take um, um, to to shoot a film themselves, and so on and so forth. So the way how they participated in this visual um, culture are different. But um, it definitely became a, a visual everyday practice to to the soldiers in general. Mm -hmm. I there's a story you bring gender into the uh, article as well, and talking about how these collections survive and how they are um, kept in families and maybe also reorganized in families. And one of your examples is of uh, a a wife. I think it was a wife who. Um, made a gift in 1980 to her husband of these pictures from this colonial war in the 1930s and that she put it all in an album. And I was <laughs> just so shocked by this story, especially that time, 1980. Um, my family is from Germany. They have many embarrassing photo albums if one thinks about the Nazi past. And uh, they they don't know what to do with those albums. There's no way in 1980 they were putting an album together of some of the atrocious images they mm. had collected. And mm. I was wondering what you took from that and if you had any uh, any contact with the family about asking that question of why is there not shame mm -hmm. around these colonial experiences? Mm -hmm. um Gender is a really important aspect when we are thinking of um, family memory, because um, in my research, I learned that it is very often the wives, the daughters who are feeling responsible for the material, for these collections of colonial photographs, and who are very self-confident in dealing with this material. They do not just keep it the way um, the father or the, the husband brought it home from the colonies. They were, in, in some cases, they were confident enough to rearrange it, to, to create an album in the first place, mm -hmm. um, to come up with own visual narrations, etc. cetera. Um, 
in the course of my PhD project, I visited around 30 families and talked with the, mm -hmm. with the wife sometimes, but most often with the generation of the children. And the question why there is no shame or why, why they still keep it was, was a question that really um, yeah, occupied my mind around the time. And of course, I was um, addressing this question with the families as well. And the answer is actually, I think there are two aspects here. The, the first one is families are still keeping these colonial images uh, because to them, the, the material represents the last leftovers of the father. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so the colonial aspect really isn't that important anymore. It, it it is rather about having a material presence of the father who is gone. Um, and the other one is that in in the study of this um, of this um, German speaking minority, we see that the questions of of um, perpetratorship of ma of who committed mass violence in the colonies, etc., is externalized to the Italians, whoever that is, but of course not the Germans in in the family narration. So, in the family legends, the fathers always appear as the good colonizers, the brava gente, but only as German speaking brava gente, and the the cruel and brutal colonizers are always the Italians. Yeah, no, I, I, that, that makes a lot of sense. And yes, <laughs> I, I was wondering, have you, have you had, have you shown your work or have you worked with scholars of Ethiopia? Um, has there been exchange about your, your project, your approach, the images themselves? What, what have uh, scholars of the region um, thought in, and if you haven't had that contact that's fine too but I was wondering mm -hmm. just curious about where your work would sit for them mm -hmm. I was actually in contact with a scholar from the University of Merkele uh, he was interested in the material I collected um, in terms of a history of environmental mm -hmm. um, history of environment um, because um, as you can imagine the soldiers took a lot of pictures from the landscapes and so on and so forth. And so he wanted to uh, get an idea how landscapes changed over time. And hopefully we can make it happen that I can yeah. um, share the material because since my book um, was published last year, the mm -hmm. material is now, the digitized material is now available via the Tyrolean archive of photography. Oh, yeah, around. The family is yeah. willing to to give the rights. That's yes. They they Nobody. must have trusted you greatly. Yes, I, I and I'm really grateful for that experience and for the trust they put in me. Um, it, it wasn't always easy because, as you can imagine, when you work with families and about family history, this is a very sensitive topic, mm -hmm. and um, and it really requires a lot of trust and patience. Mm -hmm. um, but I I was able to convince most of the families to share the, the collections with mm -hmm. the public so that we got the material digitized and available in the Tyrolean archive of photography in Lienz, um, which also means that this material leaves the, the private context and becomes cultural heritage for the study of, of Italian colonialism, which I think is amazing. And I hope that a lot of scholars are using this opportunity to, to uh, dig into this new archive of privately kept and produced um, photo collections from Italian colonialism. Oh, absolutely. And I think it's just wonderful to incorporate the allogeny in this story. I think that this is such an important move. Um, so now I have to ask different questions, <laughs> because that's my job. Uh, what a really quick one is, how was your experience working with the journal Modern Italy? Was it, uh, was it, was it the first time you'd published with them? Was it uh, why did you choose to work with them? I think it was part of a special issue, but I was just wondering, you know, a lot of people who listen to these or watch these videos are trying to figure out where they want to sit with their own work as well. And I wondered if mm -hmm. you wanted to give any insight. Yeah. I'm, member, I'm also a member of the Association for the Study of Modern Italy and Modern Italy is the, the journal of this association. And when you're doing Italian studies, uh, 
it doesn't take long to figure out that modern Italy is one of the places you you dream to publish your work one day. And when um, the 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 call for papers was published about the visual cultures um, mm -hmm. from um, Carmen Palmonte and Laura Cecchini, I I knew that this could be <laughs> my my chance to to get um, a piece into this fantastic, uh, amazing journal. And I'm really grateful that the editors, the guest editors, um, choose my proposal. Yeah, no, it's, it, it's very, in fact, in fact, they had, a, they've been winning a lot of awards and they also made your article open access um, uh, in recognition of your prize. They were so happy to hear that it was chosen. Um, now I, we have to start wrapping up. So I have two quick questions and they're not quick, but I need you to answer them quickly. One is how is, you've already kind of already answered this, but is your book, which is part of what this uh, article research is, right? Is it going to be translated into Italian or into English? And and if not, why? <laughs> Besides the fact it's very hard to do yeah, translation. Yeah. And then the second is where are you going next with your work? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, regarding language, I, I decided to publish the book in the first place in German because the work I did is corresponding with with the international um, state of the art regarding to show um, visual about visual culture of um, fascist colonialism and memory of fascist colonialism. But this book is also for the families I worked with, right. so it was really important for me to 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 let them know what I did with the materials they they um, gave me. But I really hope that I will be able to. Um, make a translation happen into English in the first place and then maybe also in Italian that would be absolutely amazing but um, yeah the money is is yeah. the, the big question time, mark it, here it yeah. takes an enormous amount of time yeah. your second question well, is um, about the next project yes um, with my new position here at the University of Graz I started uh, my second book project which will deal with um, the with Habsburg imperialism in Austria's historical culture. So I will investigate how this idea of Austria-Hungary being not being a colonial power was um, was formed throughout the 20th century. Because um, while it is common sense in the scientific community that the Austrian-Hungarian um, empire was an empire, um, Within the the historical culture, this myth, this idea is very strong that Austria, uh, Hungary was not uh, a colonial power. So I will I will try to to deconstruct this myth and see what and how uh, this went down through the 20th century and to which actors were involved in this enterprise. Well, this seems like the perfect uh, segue for my last question. I, I posted online that I would be interviewing you today and I asked, would anyone have any suggestions about what I should ask? And the great Peter Judson, who is a the, the, the father of Habsburg studies currently right now, uh, said, ask him about the website. <laughs> <laughs> so can you can you explain what, what he's talking about and why he's so excited by it? Thank you, Peter. Um, he's, he's referring to our... Um, amazing public history um, project uh, we founded during my visiting studentship at the EUI in 2018. I'm co coordinating this with Daphne Pudas, who is a PhD researcher at the EUI. And we founded this um, public history project, this website entitled um, www.postcolonialitaly.com. And this is a website that tries to map colonial traces, material traces of Italian colonialism in Italy's public spaces. Um, and we do not do this on our own. We, 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 the only way we can do this is with the amazing help from a lot of scholars who are willing to share the knowledge about different cities. Um, and, and this is an attempt to foster the public debates on, on how we can deal with the material leftovers of colonialism in Italy. Well, I was in Florence during the pandemic and I took advantage of your guys' website to, to deal with my senses of being caged in. And at least it brought me to think of Florence in a different way. Well, thank you. 
You and I could talk uh, a lifetime, and I hope as scholars we will be talking together for a lifetime, but unfortunately we can't talk much more. I just want to congratulate you again for the prize and for the amazing work and keep at it and keep uh, keep publishing, not just in German, um, <laughs> although I love German. Um, is there any last word you want to say? Thank you so much for for your work, for the association's work, and also for the for the hard work the the jury put into the prizes. I'm I'm really grateful. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Marcus. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Wait. Let me see how to.